Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I guess if you just want to go ahead, uh, you got the floor. <laughs> Great. So I don't know, and Giselle's spoken. Yeah, yeah, she just spoke. Great. Um, yeah, well, hello everybody from Toronto. Um, yeah, I'm really, really uh, thrilled that you asked me to join you. And uh, the films that you just saw are, are all such amazing sort of snapshots of what's happening um, for queer and trans people in prison. Uh, I was asked to talk today a little bit about movement building. And I think that, yeah, I, I sort of want to think about it in a couple of ways. I mean, first of all, there's, you know, sort of the larger scale, maybe, um, um, yeah, larger scale movement building, things like the film festival that you're at right now where you're bringing people together to talk about um, to talk about prisons and talk about our experiences talk about the experiences of other people who have recently gotten out um, talk about the different kinds of carceral spaces that we end up finding ourselves in talk about targeted policing of our communities um, but then there's also sort of day-to-day -day things that we do as part of abolition work or as part of trying to imagine something else so I guess I'll talk a little bit about both. First of all, um, one of the things that uh, I was involved here uh, in Toronto doing was um, actually helping to start uh, the Prisoner Justice Film Festival in Toronto. And part of why we decided to do it was that, you know, it seems like the kind of thing, I don't know if it's just a Toronto thing, but there's a whole thing about film festivals here. And people <laughs> like to come together and um, and watch movies. People like to come together and watch movies and then talk about them. And so if we wanted to get, you know, in 2004 when, when PJAC first started, we were trying to figure out how to get more people talk, talking about prisons and talking about abolition. And this seemed like a, a relatively comfortable way for people to get to do that. And I think that for me as an artist, I, I'm very interested in the ways that art can create these moments for us to have these conversations or to just start actually imagining what a world could look like without prisons or what our societies could look like if we weren't just you know totally into capitalism and systemic oppressions that sort of build up the structures of our society um, and art can be a really interesting way to to do that so we started this prison justice film festival and out of that um, came this uh, sort of push to do more organizing together. It really was building a movement. And one of the things that we did um, sort of in the second or third year of the film festival was actually start a youth-led campaign called the 81 Reasons Campaign. And there was a, a sort of a huge number of um, not only queer and trans youth, but that was a big portion of the people who were involved who got involved in organizing around the building of the Roy McMurtry Center in Brampton, which at the time was just a little glimmer of an idea and an $81 million promise to spend $81 million to build this youth super jail in Brampton. And we got together and decided that we would try to raise awareness about the fact that this was being built for people in Brampton who might not know, and also to talk about the 81 other reasons, other things that we could do with $81 million other than build a youth super jail. And that campaign was really, um, I think it was a really, even though the, the, the jail was built, it's now the Roy, Roy McMurtry Center, it was a really good example of how to, you know, do mobilizing within the communities that are most affected by the, the thing. So it was, you know, doing campaign organizing and doing mobilizing within high schools and also within uh, neighborhoods that with youth in Brampton. And um, anyways, I, I was so happy to be, to be part of that. And I think that those are sort of examples of larger scale movement building that can um, really make some significant things happen. But I guess what I would want to talk the most about today is, is sort of the day-to-day, -day, the day-to-day -day things that happen. Um, and one of the things that I think is really exciting that launched um, last year is this website called Everyday Abolition. And some of you may know it. It's, um, there's stories, there's anecdotes, there's personal narratives, and it's just this way of kind of Get, Chanel Gallant is one of the people who, who pulls everything together and they gather these stories of people who just through their day-to-day -day getting up, you know, making decisions about 
what they do in each step of their day, they're building abolitionist principles into, um, into their work. And I think that that's really an exciting opportunity because it starts to take away this idea that talking about a world without prisons is so unbelievable and so grandiose and so unimaginable and it makes it something that actually is really, really tangible and that we can actually feel and taste and touch because it's in the day-to-day minutia of our lives that we're actually starting to dismantle the prison industrial complex. And to me, that's <coughs> really encouraging and exciting. Um, another thing that I think you know is sort of in the day-to-day, I'm a parent and I don't know if I'm shaking this computer too much. Sorry if I'm giving everybody vertigo. But I'm a parent and I think that some of the to me, the really exciting uh, things that are happening um, are around just how we're sort of building this understanding of prison abolition and of uh, dismantling the prison industrial complex to the really, really young members of our community. So how do you talk to kids who are in daycare about conflict resolution and about uh, alternative disputes resolution and how to talk to each other and how to um, de-escalate and how to negotiate and how to share um, in ways that are um, age appropriate but that lay a foundation for the kinds of human act- interactions that I think we're going to need as we move towards a world without prisons. And I'll just show you there's this um, book. Luckily I'm, I'm in my toddler's room right now. This is perfect timing. But this book, A is for Activists, um, uh, that I you read to her almost every night and one of the first pages is sort of like an alphabet and every page is a different <coughs> kind of activist but the first page is uh, A is for activist, advocate, abolitionist, ally, actively answering a call to action, are you an activist? And she says happily, yes, I'm an activist, or no, depending on her day. But the fact that I'm an activist, is going to be a word that she will have heard from 18 months onward. She will know what the word abolitionist means, and that'll be part of something that will roll off the tongue. I'm not. I don't know what her choices and her decisions will be. I mean, she could be Alex B. Keaton. She could be, you know, from Family Ties. Any anything is possible. But that the word abolition is not going to be something that she has to just learn at 30 or 40 or 50. It will be something that'll be built into her understanding. There's also a terrific. Um, resource for a little bit older kids called Wizards Around the Rainbow and it's a transformative justice coloring book and through the coloring book there's exercises there's games that the kids can then practice with their friends it talks about you know conflict resolution it talks about you know understanding um, the idea of transformative justice uh, as told through drawings of rainbows and games that they could play on the playground at recess And I think that those are really kind of interesting ways to think about doing abolitionist work that is just part of the, the, I mean, as a parent, that's just the daily uh, sort of minimal, um, you know, just the day-to-day actions of my life is just reading my kid a book or coloring with her. But I'm sort of building that in. And I think that it's really exciting that there's these authors and artists who are creating these kind of resources so that as parents, we can just sort of pick them up and then start to use them. Um, I think that, yeah, art is a really terrific way, as I say, of sort of bringing people together. And I know that you watched films today about Cece McDonald, and I think that um, there was some really amazing work by Les Feinberg, who, um, you know, is based out of the United States, and uh, after Cece's arrest, really got involved in rallying and trying to build a movement uh, around this idea of free Cece. And one of the things that they did was to solicit images from people of um, their own actions, uh, whether they were large-scale rally demonstrations, whether they were um, things that people were doing at pride festivals around the world, whether it was somebody writing free CC in chalk on uh, their, uh, their walkway in front of their house, whatever, and collecting all these images and then one of the things that Les committed to do to doing was to release a new image that talked about freeing CC every single day for a year. And so this was sort of this actually really quite simple kind of 
movement building, but it got people excited. They wanted to do something sometimes just to be able to send less a picture, right? And it got people talking about CC and it got people talking and sort of spreading this idea and this message around. And I think that that's, you know, I think it's really, um, it's really exciting. And I think, you know, in Toronto, there was a lot of, uh, we, I, I'm one of the people who organizes Blockorama, which is the Black Queer and Trans stage at Pride. And there was a lot of activism um, that happened at Blockorama over the past two years related to uh, CC. And, you know, we had people send pictures of themselves holding up free CC signs at Blocko to less. And I think that that was really exciting. And I will say that, you know, Blockorama is also an example where this is an arts based um, form of, of sort of black, queer, and trans community building that talks about um, creating space and creating community, creating an opportunity for us to talk about HIV and AIDS activism and supporting people who are living with HIV and AIDS uh, through art and creativity. But that space is also an abolitionist space. And so the politics of abolition is built into the framework. So, um, you know, for the first 12 years of the festival, we refuse to have any outside security pride for all of their stages. They have security and they have a security force that kind of, you know, anyways, does what security forces do, um, which is part of this whole framework. And we instead had community members who would volunteer to be sort of um, just there to sort of provide uh, support, provide conflict resolution, provide water, provide all of those kind of things that can de-escalate a situation without needing to have a security force as um, as part of what's there. Um, and then I think lastly, I'll just say that, you know, there's really uh, some exciting work that has happened. Um, you know, we, I was talking in the beginning about this idea that sometimes people just want to watch movies together and that's a way of beginning a conversation. And I think that another really strong uh, an interesting way of building um, abolitionist movements, particularly within queer and trans communities, through music. And I think that, you know, in Toronto there's um, a band that's called Lal, and they have consistently, over the 15 or 16 years that they've been together, put out music that is specifically talking about the prison industrial complex, whether it's songs, they have a song called Light of Day, which is talking about uh, Palestine and talking about the occupation. They have a song called Our Protection, which is all about their experience with the G20 and targeted policing and how many, how the police force was brought in, you know, en masse to Toronto and the amount of money that was spent on doing that. Um, you know, songs like Erase Me, which talks about immigration, detention, and deportation. Their third album is actually called Deportation and talks, most of the songs in some way, talk about border crossings and immigration detention. Um, they have a song called uh, Your Body Could Start a War with, that was recorded in, in collaboration with Leah Lakshmi Piepshina Samarasina, who's based out of Oakland, that is just talking about the experience of racialized um, lesbians crossing borders. And I think, you know, also thinking about artists like Afua Cooper, who on her album, Worlds of Fire in Motion, she's a professor and a dub poet, and she has a, a piece that's called, I Don't Care If Your Nanny Was Black. Great song, and that book is like, and she fed you grits for breakfast every morning, and you knew a black girl in high school, and she was nice, and she was your best friend, and she was nice. I don't care, that's the lyric. But in, you know, one of the whole verses is talking about Michael Griffiths, and how he was shot by the police, um, and they all got off, even though witnesses testified to their crime. And so they, this idea of crime, so they, uh, you know, that's really interesting that she kind of brings it in. And then, you know, artists like Lucky Dubé, who writes about prisons and prison expansion, and, uh, and how, you know, people are building this idea of building and building and building and expanding the prison system without, uh, you know, saying, building other things like schools or community centers. And then um, artists like Faith Nolan, who uh, you know has done entire CDs that are about prison, but in particular talking about queer women in prison and uh, queer racialized women in prison. So um, I think that it's there's some really amazing stuff that happens through uh, activism like that through music, and I mean music is such a sort of unifying way for people to come together and just relax and hang out and get riled up and everything all at once. Um, and then just to kind of go literally to this idea of day-to-day -day abolition, there's, you know, things like the Certain Days 
Freedom for Political Prisoners calendar, uh, which is based out of Montreal. And I think it's really important to think about these Canadian examples. And I think that that's an example where, um, you know, they've got all of these different artists submitting artwork uh, and then people writing stories. And so there was a whole uh, piece written about C.C. MacDonald in the 2013 calendar. But that's something that literally just from an act of glancing at while you're trying to book your dental appointment, you're looking at something that is about uh, abolition and about change and seeing artwork by prisoners themselves, ex-prisoners, uh, talking about their experiences. So maybe I'll leave it there and then we can talk more about it in the discussion. But I think that, you know, both, whether it's large, um, large M and B, large B movement building, or just the day-to-day -day movement building of uh, just, you know, trying to live our lives and, and raise our families and be good to each other. I think that there's so much that can be sparked and fueled and inspired through creativity and art and activism. Cool. Thanks, Cyrus. Um, maybe we can take some questions and then we can let you go. How does that sound? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Cyrus? I mostly want to say hello. Hi, Giselle. How are you? It's so good to see you. And I feel like I need to just say that this, like the Prisoner's Justice Film Festival came out of a, the very first meeting of PJAC where you were like, meh, maybe we should do a film festival. And, and then it just took off from that point, right? Uh, yeah, and I just, I guess I want to acknowledge that because, yeah, you're brilliant and you've inspired a lot of movements and you've inspired a lot of people to do really amazing work. So, thank you. Thanks, Giselle. I think, you know, it's, it's just this, the, the, one of the nice, like, the great things about being to work with Giselle, and PJAC, and getting to work with, you know, Aiden and Sean and all the people who were sort of involved in that was that there was a sense of effortlessness. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience with organizing. I haven't had it all the time. I would say it's not a totally unique experience. Um, um, I, or, sorry, it, it is a totally unique experience for me, is that it seemed very effortless because there was a, a, a genuine uh, uh, receptiveness to trying new things. And because, maybe it's because there was so little that had been done around organizing, around Prisoners Justice in Toronto at the time, outside of organizing around Prisoners Justice Day, which is significant and, and totally important, but, you know, sort of doing organizing throughout the year, there was not a lot that had happened. So. In a way, it, it gave us this opportunity to imagine that anything is possible. And I think that one of the things that, um, to kind of carry that forward, you know, it's such a luxury, it's such a treat, and a, and a gift to be able to sit and talk to other people about what we want our societies to look like when there aren't prisons. And I think that we don't always get a chance to do that. And, you know, at the very least, that was what we got to do through PJEC, was just to sit and talk about it. And I know that when I came for the film festival in London last year, it was amazing to hear the organizing that you were all doing um, in all of the different areas. I mean, I went to almost all of the screenings, and in all of the different areas, there's so much tremendous organizing happening in London. And it was just such a gift to be able to be part of those conversations and to hear what people were working on and to start talking about what what do we, in all of these different cities, in all of these different places, what do we want to see? What do we want to imagine? Um, because I think we kind of get stopped in the conversation before we get to that point, and then if you never imagine it, you can't make it happen, so. years ago, 2005. Um, one of the biggest things I've found in dealing with police and the system in general is that there doesn't seem to be an in you don't have a way of preventing people from going there in the first place. It's like 
Giselle's touched on that issue where Mr. Doc Sears has done all this work to improve himself, but yet when he's ready to take that next step to have his own life self directed, he, he kind of got shoved back into the discrimination and racism and whatnot. And I found that in my own life, just really trying to fight against that. And it only helps breed more anger and resentment towards people in authority. And it's kind of a, it's a vicious cycle that people who get caught up in the system get stuck in. And it's really hard to break that unless there's people that are willing to show that compassion, no matter how horrendous their crimes are, to try to look past that crap that they've committed to someone else to get to that person to see why they did what they did and what kind of crap was going on in their life. Um, and I consider myself lucky. Um, I've been in and out of the system combined five years total maybe, but I know people who have been in and out of the system probably 90% of their life. So they've been out in the world maybe a year of their entire life. And that is scary to think about. Um, so I'm, I guess I wanted to talk and share a bit about my story because just because they get caught up in the system doesn't mean there isn't people within the system to help you. Um, there's people like Giselle and Nicole and I've met other people within the system that helped me to be able to look at my own self and look at my own actions and how to overcome them and be able to stand up in front of new people and talk. And even my whole trans identity was discovered within that system. But it wasn't the jail guards holding the key. It wasn't the fact I was sitting in a concrete cell with steel bars that helped me. It was being in an institution that was filled with people who gave a crap about me, showed me compassion, um, actually sat down and listened to what I had to say without being discriminated against, without being judged. And one thing that I had learned when I was out of that system was that I was going to be placed right back into that line of sight of those police officers, of other people out in the public for discrimination. Um, I had to learn how to deal with that and not retaliate and fall back into old behaviors. Um, and, but that wasn't done by PIC, that was done by people in the therapist communities, in uh, spiritual groups, in support groups, social groups. It was people that deal with people. All the PIC does is throw you in a cell and lock the key and, and treat you like a piece of meat and you're not a human being. Um, it's been, it was said in the movies that prison systems aren't fit for humans, they're not fit for animals, they're just a method of containment. And all that does is hide the symptom, fix the symptom, it doesn't, doesn't help give a cure to what the real issue is. And I guess my perspective is that society in general, our, our culture in general, needs to needs help in looking at its own dark side. It needs help in looking at its own crimes that it, it's committed against itself. Because it's kind of that vicious circle. Like if you believe that we're all connected, if you believe that we all have something in common, then Locking that person away is cutting itself. You're just cutting that, that disease off, but it's going to come back in that vicious cycle, and it's just going to keep going. So we need to educate and, and I guess, help teach compassion and help dump that apathy that seems to be prevalent in, in our culture, and racism and discrimination and um, all the anger and resentment that we seem to have. Uh, in our society. Because um, that reflects on in how I felt about myself, because that's the only message I heard growing up, is anger, resentment, and negative messages. And it took, it took me sitting in a jail cell, losing my family, my sanity, and my freedom to realize that, what the hell am I doing? Why am I doing this to myself, despite the people that are hurting me? And it's, it's truly insanity. And that's really what, what is insane about the whole thing. And so I hope by telling my story and joining in with Giselle and the other programs that are getting started by this festival, that I can help do something about it. Thank you.
suppose the primary reason that I was asked to speak here uh, was because I've been active in trans sort of human rights, employment, family law issues. Um, and probably the, the thing that I've done the most of is trying to raise awareness and, um, and educate professionals and, um, and other groups, uh, unions, and doing trainings and things like that. So presenting at employment law conferences um, on trans legal issues, trans human rights issues, and uh, discrimination in the workplace, um, and those sorts of things. Um, speaking at, at union conferences or human resource professional association conferences. Um, and that's part of that is, I think, the virtue of my profession. Um, so I'm, I am a lawyer, and that gives me some access, uh, and has given me access to these spaces where people who make decisions about things that impact people's lives on the ground, uh, where there can be some influence there, and expand um, opportunities, probably for a particular class of trans people. Um, I don't know that you know, systems of distribution of resources in our society are not, um, they're not obviously equally distributed. Um, so when you take a rights-based approach to things, um, people who are facing multiple barriers and multiple levels of discrimination, um, those folks tend to have the least, just the least impact um, from a rights-based approach. So, looking at all of this, I, and in thinking about what I was going to talk about tonight, I, I find um, the thought of, of prison abolition um, to be quite daunting. Um, and I, I think that's something that, that, was being, that was said in the videos, I think the, what I took um, as sort of positive messages using taking abolition and putting it into our daily lives as a way to uh, maintain some positive uh, results and, and to incorporate it into our lives and see some of that, at least in the space that, that we have some control over. Um, and in, in our communities. I think it's a challenge though, because there are horizontal issues between our communities, especially when it comes to trans folks. Um, so, you know, at the same time, um, you have the Canadian Human Rights Commission and, uh, and the federal court dealing with the case of Cynthia Kavanaugh, uh, a trans woman prisoner and figuring out where to house her and coming to the conclusion that it wasn't safe to house her in a women's prison because she could do unspeakable things to uh, female prisoners who would be vulnerable. Um, you also had Vancouver Rape Relief saying, uh, we won't allow Kimberly Nixon to provide rape counseling services to women because she could also per, per, uh, perpetrate these unspeakable things. Women uh, who uh, had experiences of violence, you know, in the case of both Vancouver Rape Relief and in the case of the prisons, um, wouldn't be able to, they would be assaulted essentially by her presence. Uh, so, I think trans people haven't found homes necessarily in radical movements, uh, and also in mainstream society. So um, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. And I think it's also a challenge in terms of how we've approached um, certain social issues. So you have a situation of violence against women. Um, so, I, I work in the family court, so I, I deal with that issue quite a bit. Uh, people come in running for restraining orders and trying to get 
um, the state involved in protecting them because that seems to them to be the first the, the first avenue to pursue and, and they feel like it's the most effective avenue. Um, the other thing is, you know, there was a period in time where violence against women wasn't being considered to be taken seriously by uh, the police. So they mandated, um, you know, basically if there was a complaint and there was anything to back it up, that there were charges that were laid. And there was a loss of police discretion with respect to, to pressing charges. So, you know, and, and that I think came from a, a feminist um, sort of assertion that these violent violence against women was something that had to be taken seriously by the police. So you have multiple kind of contradicting the people being pulled in multiple ways and not necessarily seeing that there are some overarching things that lead to um, violence in our society um, and including violence, interpersonal violence and also state-imposed violence. So making those connections, I think, is, is a difficult thing to do, um, but an important one. And so I think in terms of movements, um, being able to build coalitions amongst a number of different people working on very uh, important issues have you know, a sort of a common understanding of how their movements impact other people and other people's movements. I don't have tremendous ideas about how to do that, and I'm too busy probably to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think there's some encouraging stuff. Um, you know, the, the recent Bedford decision uh, regarding, people are familiar with that? No. Um, so the Supreme Court struck down, confirmed a, an Ontario Superior Court of Justice decision striking down the sex work uh, regulation laws. Um, sex work hasn't been criminalized in Canada, but all of the things around uh, sex work have been criminalized. Um, and especially in ways that, uh, that create quite a bit of um, vulnerability for people doing sex work, especially street-based sex work. Prim uh, the communication laws prevent people from screening uh, clients and, uh, and, and things like that. So the Supreme Court found that <coughs> the way that the federal government was trying to regulate or, or has been regulating sex work um, put sex workers' lives uh, at risk. It's interesting though because in that decision, the court said, you know, if striking down these laws could have saved one of the women from uh, Robert Pickin, right, then striking down these laws would be worth it. The court did not say, look at all of the women that we put into prison and subject to violence that is akin to what Brother Pickton did, um, but much more prevalent. Um, and and I, I think there's a blind spot there. Um, but in any event, you know, if sex work laws are struck down, then we're going to have a lot fewer people coming into the prison system. Um, at, the, at the same time, I think now is a really important time to talk to your MPs, to write letters, because what happens, if the government has a year to uh, rejig the system of laws around sex work. Uh, so there is the possibility that they will just allow it to be decriminalized or they will legalize and regulate. Um, but there's also the potential that they will criminalize it in different ways. The, the decision itself 
leaves it open for, I, I think, for just on a very technical legal level, for the, for the government to criminalize all sex work. Um, but it seems like the more likely outcome will be um, moving to a Nordic model criminalizing the clients. And that also, uh, I think, creates vulnerability for sex workers. Um, and, and I think it's important for, for us to express that that is not the way to, to deal with it and, and let decision makers know about that. Um, okay, so just a couple of final points. Um, you know, the drug laws are also something that uh, brings a lot of people into the prison system and also uh, operates in a very discriminatory way, um, surveilling uh, Aboriginal people, uh, people of color, um, and low-income people more than a number of other uh, people. Um, but the Liberal Party now has, as part of its platform, the legalization of marijuana. I'm not saying that that's going far enough, but within the mainstream, I think there's some idea that it's a waste of money to put people in prison uh, for something that pretty well everybody does. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, that's a positive step forward. And, and finally, I mean, you know, it's a challenge to work within the system versus outside the system or within community. Um, so I'm looking very much forward to the, the uh, event where the lawyer who's suing uh, EMBC will be speaking to, to see what, I mean, I don't think the prisons, I think it's pretty clear that the prison system doesn't even um, meet the expectations of people who are in favor of prisons, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have four or six or eight people in a, in a cell, I think the whole community can agree that that is, uh, or does agree that that's not acceptable in, in any fashion. Not to say that any sort of um, deprivation of, you know, it's, well, I'm not saying where the line is drawn, but um, and I think there are challenging issues in terms of, uh, you know, certainly violent offenders and people who had engaged in a system and cycle of violence um, and been victimized themselves and, and how all that plays out. Um, but certainly the fewer people we can get in, have in prison and the more people uh, we can have getting supports in the communities, in communities so that they don't have to be criminal, so they don't become criminalized, so they don't have to interact with the system, um, you know, the better. So, thank you very much. This has been fantastic. Um, thank you for asking me to like to sponsor this event. I have learned a lot. In fact, my head's spinning. And I've got a lot to go home and think about because I had no idea about any of this. Um, I'm the Peak Leg Mom in London. I'm not sure if there's many of you. There's a few familiar faces. Uh, what we do is we offer support um, to people during the coming out and living out process. Um, I'm a mom of a queer daughter. I wish that when I had given birth to each of my kids, instead of the uh, doctor going, congratulations, Lori, you've got a boy. Congratulations, Lori, you've got a girl. That the doctor had said, Congratulations, Lauren, you've got what looks like a boy and looks like a girl, but they could be gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer. Go home, love them, and teach them how to love everybody else. Because I think if we started there, right, at the beginning in that delivery room, we'd have a whole different world. And so my, uh, my passion and my love for our uh, queer community, I can't even tell you. I feel gifted and privileged to have a gay child. I'm here to help anybody, their parents, themselves, their aunts, uncles, grandparents, spouses that have any questions or need any support whatsoever during that process. Thank you. Thank you for coming out.
tonight, uh, a group of us came together with a vision and wanted to bring people to talk about, together to talk about prisons and the prison industrial complex. Uh, many of us represent different groups, including at LOSA, Peak Magazine, the Muslim Student Association, and Amnesty Western, the Latin American Canadian Solidarity Association, La Casa, and the International Network in Solidarity with Colombian Political Prisoners, the London Area Network of Substance Users, the Indignants, People for Peace, the Deshpanzi being Native Women's Association, PFLAG, and many individuals. Although a few of us, very few of us were working on prison issues in particular, what we recognized is that all our movements intersect with the prison industrial complex. And that gave us a unique opportunity for movement building and getting out of our silos and working together. We wanted to find interesting ways of highlighting, initiating discussions, and we thought we could do that through arts, film, documentaries, and panel discussions, some of what Cyrus talked about tonight. So we know that there's an overrepresentation of Indigenous people, people of color, uh, immigrants, two-spirit, queer and trans people, drug users, sex workers, people with mental health issues and disabilities, as well as women. The festival organizers wanted to bring these issues into the forefront of our discussions, including global and local issues. So we wanted to try and make this event as accessible as possible. Uh, and that meant that we made this event free tonight, uh, and that you know, there was lots of ways that we tried to make this film accessible <coughs> and this film, and we thank ASO, Peter Group, for coming and also sharing, and Jessica for all the work that she put into helping make this happen. Thank you. is that, um, well, one of the gifts that we had was that this year's Prisoner's Justice Film Festival spans almost two weeks, which is phenomenal since last year it was only a weekend's worth, not only, it was a great weekend's worth of events. <laughs> uh, but so many people were interested and engaged that they came out this year and said we want to be involved as well. And, and we actually didn't have, like, there was places that we didn't have room to have particular sections that we wanted to have. Uh, so tomorrow, tomorrow day, you're gonna, there's a panel here again, uh, starting at 2 o'clock on violence against Indigenous women. Uh, then we've got a panel on political prisoners in Colombia. In the evening, we're going to be talking about the Bedford case with uh, sex workers and the prison industrial complex. And then, as Nicole mentioned, on Sunday, we're going to be talking with uh, Kevin Egan, the lawyer who's taken on the class action suit against Elgin Middlesex Detention Center. Um, so we're really excited about that panel and hope that many of you can make it out there as well. That one is at Toll Puddle, not here. Uh, all day tomorrow is here. Um, yeah, and unfortunately we were only able to raise $200 before, before we started this event and we were like, well, we'll just work it out. Um, yeah, we just didn't want that to be a limitation on making this event accessible and engaging and interesting for people and people who are most affected by the criminal justice system in whatever way to be able to come and attend. And so this is kind of where you come in. <laughs> We're asking that if you have a toonie or a 20 that you can drop in a bag that Abe's going to be holding at the back of the room, the bright blue uh, bag there. Uh, if you have donations that you want to offer us, we'd be really grateful. That's going to help us pay for the space that we've rented here in particular. It's also going to help us pay for the ASL interpreter and just other like, kind of equipment, all the basic stuff. And if, by some chance, we actually have extra money, it's going to go towards next year's Prisoner and Justice Film Festival. So again, we really thank you for coming out. It was great to have you. Anybody who's interested in being a part of the Prisoner's Correspondence Project, we ask you to come up and sign paperwork. And just to let you know that we have artwork done up here. We've got some prints done by a prisoner uh, in, in Bath Prison. His name's Peter Collins. Uh, he's doing a life sentence right now and is also probably about eight years past his date. So we're looking to try and raise funding for his legal costs. Uh, and so we've made prints of his artwork that are selling for $20. So if you want to come up and take a look at his artwork, we'll be here for that as well. So thank you again for coming. Really enjoyed having you. Awesome. So I will see you, uh, or I'll talk to you. We'll go for coffee when this is all done. Okay? I'm just going to go outside. Thank you so much. I'm just like, she's